good afternoon. My name is uh, Muriel Joly. I'm working for a company uh, called Under the Milky Way, which is based in Paris and in Los Angeles. And we are a digital aggregator, which uh, I will explain more into uh, detail uh, later. But I've been uh, working for um, more than, uh, I think, seven years now in digital distribution. And today I will take you through uh, the basics of digital distribution and video on demand. Uh, but please do not hesitate to uh, interact and raise uh, questions uh, during the whole presentation. Uh, this afternoon I will first uh, define what is uh, video on demand. Then we will go through the different video on demand rights from transactional VOD to SVOD, which you must have learned uh, or heard about a lot. Um, then we will go through uh, the business and the legal aspects of digital distribution. I'll talk also about uh, aggregators and their role as intermediaries between the rights holders, the producers or the filmmakers, and the VOD platforms. I'll talk about the marketplace, the local, the global one. And I will also, I have brought uh, case studies uh, in order to give you some concrete example of uh, digital distribution and also a very concrete example of some uh, digital marketing strategies that we have implemented for some uh, documentaries that we have uh, distributed through under the Milky Way. And then I'll, I'll conclude with some tips I can give you to get the most out of uh, VOD. But first, uh, what is video on demand? I don't know if uh, some of you are familiar with that or consumers, as we say, uh, of uh, VOD. There, you can raise your hand, so have a quick poll. It's okay, so you know that. Uh, so basically, uh, video on demand is monetized distribution of digital video uh, content. It's both the present and the future of home entertainment. It uh, is taking the place of uh, DVD. The physical uh, uh, video market is uh, shrinking and shrinking, and nowadays it, it has become very rare that uh, uh, especially the young audience uh, do buy some DVDs to watch the film. Instead, they can find it on uh, VOD. VOD also bypasses uh, offer and demand and elim eliminates scarcity. It's available every, uh, everywhere, and you you can you do not you do not have to go to uh, a store to uh, to buy your DVD anymore. You can find it on the internet quite easily. It's also a, a new way of watching contents, delineated uh, at any time, and so it's quite. Convenient. It's uh, a way of watching films anywhere, anytime, and on, in, on any device. Also, we will see that uh, for uh, the rights holder, uh, meaning the producers, for example, uh, the video on demand is also a global marketplace that is also local, which makes it uh, very flexible and interesting to uh, make your content circulate. VOD bypasses offer and demand. In, indeed, you do not have any stocks problem anymore uh, with uh, uh, stocking your, your films on, on the internet. You do not have marginal costs selling one additional uh, uh, film to a, a consumer. And VOD is constantly available, except, of course, if you want to withdraw your film because you, you sold it uh, for TV, for example. I'll explain that uh, later. Um, VOD is also very convenient uh, as both as a viewer and also as a producer or filmmaker because you have low public publication cost. It, it does not cost a lot to put your film through uh, global platforms like iTunes, for example, uh, compared to uh, what represents a theatrical release. Uh, with the prints costs um, <clears throat> on, the, on, on the global VOD platforms, uh, the costs are reduced. 
also it's convenient because it's a centralized way of sorry of distributing content when you go uh, on uh, say iTunes or Google Play for example and you want uh, your film to be distributed there you have a single entry point and your film can be available in a lot of territories so this is a, a very uh, convenient when you do not have to uh, uh, redo the same task all over each time you're changing the territories of distribution and last uh, but sometimes it's uh, debated uh, VOD can be cheap and easy for consumers easy because it's one click you go on a, on a site or a, a store and you can pick up the film you want, look for it easily and, and click. And it's cheap because it's cheaper than a theatrical uh, ticket, for example, especially when you watch a film with your whole family uh, and you are four or five in front of the TV, then uh, it's, it's much more cheap, much cheaper, sorry. Then. VOD is global because uh, nowadays we have uh, huge actors that are acting on a global level. Uh, to name a few of them, we have iTunes, uh, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, of course, uh, that are giants having VOD stores available all over the world. Through these um, stores, the borders can easily be crossed because uh, apart from some very specific countries, uh, the films can be made available everywhere. So as a filmmaker or a producer, you can go global uh, with these tools. But VOD is also local, of course, because um, the, the local cinematography is always driven by the local tastes and the local releases. So you have local VOD stores as well where uh, for your distribution language is crucial and for which you can use geo-blocking, meaning that you can preserve and decide to distribute your film on a specific territory and block uh, the availability on the other. Is that okay? Um, so regarding the VOD rights, you must have heard about all these acronyms TVOD, SVOD, AVOD. Um, this is uh, very confusing sometimes, so I'll, I'll try to, to clarify that a little bit. The first thing is transactional VOD. Transactional VOD is replacing uh, what uh, we used to have um, with the DVDs. So transactional VOD is like when you go on iTunes, uh, you have the possibility to click uh, on Either, either to rent, sorry, or to buy a film. So when you rent a film, we call that a rental VOD, and you have 30 days to watch the film, and once you launched it, you have 24 hours to, um, to, to watch it until the end. The price point can be between 2 to 99 to uh, uh, 4 to 5.99. This is rental. The second uh, aspect of transactional VOD is purchase. You can purchase a film and own it. Uh, this is called also uh, EST, uh, electronic sell-through, or DTO, download to own. Uh, this is supposedly permanent. You download the film and you have it uh, on, on your computer, uh, like a dematerialized uh, DVD. And the price point starts from 9.99, can be uh, higher. Um, this is so you find transactional VOD on iTunes, Google, Amazon, but also the local VOD stores, uh, Proximus in Belgium or Orange in France, uh, Sky in the UK, for example. Then you have subscription VOD, which uh, we hear uh, about a lot. Subscription VOD is uh, working um, with one subscription that you pay on a monthly or yearly basis. And through this subscription, you have uh, access to a huge catalog of films with unlimited watching. Um, most of the time, the difference between SVOD and TVOD is the kind of film you can find in their libraries. Uh, TVOD is uh, often for uh, recent films that were shown in theaters a few months ago. 
whereas in SVOD, you would have what they call original content, meaning content that was never released in theaters, or uh, exclusive contents, uh, contents uh, bought exclusively for SVOD. But most of the time, when you look, you have heard about a film when it was released theatrically and then not able to go to the theater at that time, then you would go uh, through TVOD to find it a few months after. And then you have a few others of business models also. Uh, free vi video on demand, FVOD. Uh, imagine you're a producer or an NGO and you want to make a content available for free on your website. You can do that and it's uh, through Vimeo, for example. And then you have advertisement video on demand, AVOD. This is something you can find, for example, on YouTube when you um, start streaming for free and legally a content, then you will have ads that will be uh, shown and that you cannot skip uh, before watching your film. So this is a, an, another way of financing uh, the streaming. So these are the, the, the main rights. So you have TVOD, transactional VOD for renting and purchase, SVOD, subscription VOD, and then FVOD, free video on demand, and AVOD. Digital distribution. So what do you need to know if you want uh, your film to be distributed uh, through digital? If we go through the, the VOD rights chain, uh, we can see that uh, the chain has evolved uh, uh, recently. Traditionally, as a producer owning the rights of a film, uh, willing to distribute a film on an international level, you would go through a traditional path that would be the following. First, an international sales agent to which you would pitch the film and that would, that would take the film to sell it uh, in all the territories you've decided together. Then the, the sales agent would contact directly the local distributor in each country so that the local distributor take the all rights, TV, VOD, theat theatrical. And then within these rights, um, for the VOD rights, the local distributor would either go directly to a VOD platform or through an aggregator, I will explain uh, when. And uh, that's uh, usually uh, how it worked. But you can find alternative ways of distributing your film. Nowadays, a producer can do, go directly through an aggregator or uh, directly through a platform to pitch his film, uh, he or her film, uh, if the producer does not want the film to be uh, theatrically released in some territories, for example. Same for the sales agent that uh, will consider after a few markets, for example, that uh, it will be difficult to sell uh, the film uh, all rights uh, locally in some territories, then the sales agent can contact an aggregator and put the film on, uh, directly on the digital VOD platforms. So if once we have been through uh, these uh, different um, value chain, then the economical approach, the business uh, is different depending on who you have in front of you. If you decide to distribute uh, your film through a local distributor, which is the main situation, uh, most of the time the deal will be an all right sales and uh, with an MG, which is the, the most uh, current uh, business model, and within the MG, um, you will uh, have an estimate of what the film can bring in VOD, and this will be uh, put in as a lever of negotiation in, in the MG, minimum guarantee. The positive thing is that doing that, you will deal with the local actor who is an expert of uh, its own market, so it's definitely like the right person to talk to who will know exactly where the local audiences can be found. Also, this is positive because you can use digital as a lever uh, in, in your negotiation. Of course, sorry, the negative point will be the, the lack of control uh, that you will have uh, uh, letting all the rights 
to the distributor. So if you let all the rights, the TV, uh, the theatrical, and the VOD rights, you won't, will not be able to control them anymore, of course. Then going through an aggregator, which is also a common situation uh, more and more, um, working with an aggregator is uh, more and more common in the case of global platforms. What I call the global platforms are the platforms, the VOD platforms that are available uh, on a global level. So uh, iTunes, uh, Microsoft, Netflix, Amazon, and so forth. Um, these platforms have a very specific way of working with rights holders. Um, most of the time, uh, what they do is they have local teams in every country, and their local teams deal uh, only with the major uh, studios, uh, major local studios, and some major rights holders. For the rest, like individual producers or smaller distributors, they ask uh, them to go through aggregators. So aggregators are these intermediaries uh, you have to go through most of the time if you want to access distribution on the global platforms. So um, the business model in that case is um, uh, most of the time a revenue sharing for TVOD. So each time a consumer stream uh, a film, then uh, the aggregator will take a commission out of it and uh, give you the, the rest of the, uh, the revenue. Or for subscription VOD, you can have a flat fee or a fee per stream plus a commission. The positive aspect for that is that through an aggregator, you will have access to numerous platforms and a centralized digital supply chain. So you won't have to knock at everyone's doors uh, asking uh, your film to be distributed, especially because these platforms are not selective uh, all the time. So once your film uh, does fit with the technical specs and the, the length uh, is not uh, below uh, 60 minutes, for example, you are able to access uh, this uh, kind of distribution. In that case also, the technical costs are, are borne by the rights holders, but as I will explain later, they are quite limited and can be leveraged depending on the number of platforms you want to be distributed on. So what is very positive in, in, in that case is that so you have access to a numerous, uh, uh, a high number of platforms and just one entry point and you are able to be distributed on Sony and Amazon in Australia or Scandinavia, for example. The negative side, of course, is the financial one because most of the time, especially with TVOD, you, you don't have MG. So it's a, it's a, a small margin uh, business. Then you have the last case, which is a direct sales, which is quite rare, but it works for, uh, mostly with SVOD platforms. You can uh, go uh, and be in contact with, uh, say, for example, uh, Netflix. And uh, in that case, if Netflix is interested in distributing your film, then the business model is uh, very flexible. Everything is possible. You have MG, uh, revenue share, fees. Um, but um, the positive thing is that it's direct revenue for, the, for you, so very uh, uh, much higher than if you had to go through intermediaries. And the negative side is that uh, you have to deduct from the revenue you got from your sales all the technical costs that are specific to each platform. So if you decide to go on your own to each platform, then you will have to bear the technical costs that are linked to this platform and this one. And most of the time, especially with local platforms, the, the technical specs are, can vary a lot. So it's a lot of time and uh, also a lot of time to invest for what we call all the metadata, the posters that have to be uh, in a certain size, the photos. So it's something to take into account when you're dealing directly uh, with a platform. Sorry, there is a 
So if I, I do a recap of uh, the main business models that we've been through and all the key players that are involved, the, the kind of contents, the, the price for consumer, the revenue splits, and uh, the business it is replacing. If we focus on TVOD, so we've seen that there are two main business models, the rental video on demand, the one that starts around 2.99 or 4.99, and electronic sales through, uh, which is replacing really the, the DVD, and that uh, will start from 9.99. The key players for that, I, I've put iTunes or Vimeo, but you, as I mentioned, you can have Amazon, who's doing also, uh, which is doing also uh, SVOD, but you can have Microsoft, uh, Google Play also, um, and all the local uh, VOD platforms, uh, Sky, Orange, um, uh, uh, what, what can I say, Comcast in, in the US, for example. So the content in that case, accepted by these platforms, is exhaustive. I mean, there is no uh, selection, but some platforms can be selective to optimize their costs, but most of the time, especially if you go to uh, global platforms, uh, all kind of content, uh, apart of course uh, if uh, there are some uh, um, uh, sexual uh, content, can be uh, accepted. So, as I said, the, f the price is fixed for the consumer and EST is of course more expensive than VOD because through EST you can you can have the film forever. The revenue split is a share per transaction and it's replacing DVD or uh, Blu-ray. It's the equivalent. Then if uh, we have a look at, at subscription VOD, SVOD, so the business model is that you have this unlimited viewing in exchange of uh, um, a monthly or a yearly uh, subscription fee. The key players are uh, Netflix, which uh, you must have already uh, heard about, or uh, Amazon Prime Video, which is uh, Amazon is offering uh, a, a SVOD service uh, for its uh, subscribers, for example. Uh, the content is highly selective. Um, either there is a, an editorial line or a very specific content are uh, looked after for these platforms. The, as I said, uh, there is a monthly or yearly subscription fee. And in terms of revenue splits, you can have a flat fee or a fee per stream, but it varies a lot depending on the films, the availability, depending if the film is available in uh, several territories, which is uh, what uh, Netflix is uh, often looking for, or the exclusivity as well can be uh, a good, uh, very, uh, an, an important uh, point in the, in the um, amount of uh, revenue you can get from such a deal. And then a similar uh, business that would be replaced by SVOD would be the equivalent of pay TV with this subscription uh, model. And then the last model is AVOD and free VOD. Uh, so it's free for consumers, but it's financed for AVOD with uh, advertising. Uh, one of the key player is uh, YouTube. And the content varies a lot. It can be exhaustive or selective. There, there, there is no rule on, on that. So it's free. And in terms of revenue, so it's advertising income. So uh, you get a, a, a small fee each time uh, an ad is uh, streamed uh, before your, your film. So there, there is a very low monetization potential and you need huge scales to, uh, to get a significant revenue. Uh, you, can, you, you need to get millions of views to, to get an interesting uh, revenue on that. And then that would be the equivalent of a free TV. In terms of legal approach, if you decide to uh, to do your to handle the digital distribution of on your own, and uh, so you want to 
have a contract either with a platform or with uh, an aggregator. There are a few things you need to have in mind while doing uh, the contract. The first thing is, of course, the length and the exclusivity uh, of your rights. Um, what is the most common is non-exclusive VOD rights. Uh, th the thing is that you might have noticed that uh, some films can be on several platforms at the same time. So this is non-exclusive, which is a, a very common situation. And what I would advise is uh, to, in terms of length, it would be to, um, to put short-term rights in order to have a flexible exploitation and not be uh, linked uh, to a platform if it does not work uh, at all. In terms of territories, uh, as I said, it's very flexible. You can be either very specific or it can be worldwide. Uh, the advantage with, with VOD is that we have uh, geo-blocking, so you can really uh, have a contract for the whole world except two territories, for example. This is totally doable and, and manageable from the platform and secure. So in terms of types of rights exploitation, when you put it on a contract, uh, most of the time rental VOD and EOST go together in the contract. And for the other types of VOD, then they are dealt uh, separately. They, they are uh, the object of, a, of another contract. And last but not least at all, you need to put in the contract uh, the, the revenue and, uh, and the type of business model you want to have. So revenue share with or without MG, the possibility of a license fee, mainly with the SVOD platform as we saw. Also the mention of the technical costs, if the technical costs are, are taken by the aggregator, for example, will they be recoup from the sales? These are the kind of questions uh, you might want to raise and address in that part of the contract. So that's it for distribution. Then I wanted to talk about the aggregators. Uh, this is not a quite new uh, job in the industry. Uh, for example, sorry, under the Milky Way exists since 2010, I think, but uh, still a lot of people are not quite sure about uh, what uh, they do. So you have a lot of aggregators everywhere, actually. Um, at the beginning, uh, these were uh, post-production house or encoding houses in the US that decided to become uh, um, these intermediaries. But uh, nowadays, you can find uh, um, Universine in France or Digital in, uh, I think, the Netherlands. You, you have uh, a lot of uh, actors. But I will shortly present under the Milky Way because as I'm working there, I know um, uh, how we work. So this can give you an example of uh, the kind of work uh, we are doing and the added value we can have in digital distribution. So as I said, an aggregator is an intermediary of, uh, between the rights holder on the one hand, can be the filmmaker directly or the producer, the distributor or sales agent, as we saw in, in the value chain, uh, and the VOD platform on the other hand. So the VOD platform, uh, once again, can be uh, a TVOD platform or SVOD platform, or it can be a global one or a local one. So this is really, we are in, in the middle. Uh, and what uh, uh, we provide is uh, an interface of several types. The first interface we provide is uh, an, a legal one because signing a contract with an aggregator then uh, makes you represented by the aggregator in front of the platform. So the aggregator is your legal um, uh, licensee. Uh, then we are also uh, providing a technical interface. Uh, most of the time, the rights holder will bear the technical costs, but the aggregator will make sure that 
all the uh, technical files uh, that needs to be distributed uh, and sent over to the platform will be correctly done and QC uh, before accessing to the platform, meaning that uh, the video files must uh, be checked, the audio files, all the subtitling you, want, you might want to be uh, producing for the distribution, and also uh, a big part of the work, of the work sorry, is uh, the production of the metadata, the synopsis, all this information that you need to provide to the platform so that you can be uh, visible and well placed uh, once uh, you are uh, distributed on there. So this is the technical interface that the aggregator is uh, providing. Then the aggregator is also providing an editorial interface because um, for transactional uh, VOD platforms, for example, um, you have local editorial teams everywhere. So um, uh, you need, uh, we as aggregator uh, will be able to pitch the films we're distributing to these teams to make sure that they will be uh, placed uh, in, in the good sections. Uh, which is actually um, uh, an, a very important uh, job because uh, the more the editorial team know about uh, your film, uh, the better it might get uh, placed. Um, I, I, I will uh, tell you uh, a little more about it later, but uh, I will emphasize the importance of placement on a VOD store, knowing that people that are going on VOD store not knowing what to watch will stop at very specific postures or uh, specific sections. So in, it's important to be um, visible uh, at that time. Then, uh, of course, we also have... Uh, um, we also do perform, uh, provide a marketing and commercial interface uh, because we handle the, the marketing strategies, uh, especially for, uh, as under the Milky Way is concerned, uh, EU funded programs. For these programs, we do uh, create and, uh, and carry on the marketing strategies. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the aggregator is the financial interface between the platform and uh, the rights holder. So when a platform streams, uh, when a consumer goes on the platforms and buys a films, then the platforms will uh, take a share of the revenue, then send it to the aggregator, which will take its commission between 20 to 30 percent, depending on all the regions where your film is distributed. And then this money will be sent directly to the right order in a very um, regular way and quite transparent uh, because this is the advantage of digital. With digital, you are able to track uh, your sales and be able to know when was your film bought, uh, if it was T uh, rental or EST, at what price, so it's it, and on which platform. So this is uh, one of the big uh, advantage of uh, digital distribution. Um, one of uh, uh, the key um, factor of differentiation for Under the Milky Way as an aggregator is that we rely on a global network. Uh, the blue points, I think, yeah. The blue points show where uh, we have local offices all over the world. Uh, the role of uh, what we call these business partners is double. On the one hand, they ensure the distribution of all of our content and they pitch um, the, the films to the local editorial teams. So, uh, for example, our uh, business partner uh, based in Sao Paulo uh, in Latin America is in a weekly contact with the editorial team of iTunes and we pre present on a weekly basis all the releases we have. So this is one part of the job. The other part of the job is to source uh, locally the content that will di be distributed either locally, for example, say just in LATAM, or internationally. So this is uh, what we do. And we have a main hub in Paris, 
the main office and another one in uh, Los Angeles where uh, we can be in contact there with the, um, the headquarters of the global platforms. So in terms of distribution models, as I said, we, we do uh, two kinds of uh, distribution uh, aggregation. The first is the domestic rights aggregation. So for example, uh, Lucky Red, which is uh, an Italian right holders or distributor, goes to through under the Milky Way to be distributed in Italy on the global platforms like iTunes and Google, just for Italy. So mm -hmm. this is the kind of domestic uh, rights aggregation that uh, we do perform. Uh, either with iTunes, but it can also be uh, the local uh, VOD platforms. But the second model is also international uh, rights aggregation. So uh, uh, this is when we distribute on VOD platforms through uh, direct-to-digital re uh, releases. Uh, for example, uh, a big French um, distributor and producer in, French, in France called Pate, uh, which I think you, you know here as well, uh, go through under the Milky Way to distribute its uh, unsold content or, or library content on the global platforms uh, in certain uh, regions of the world. For example, we distribute the library titles from Pate in the US or in Latin America. So whereas Pate handles directly its own digital distribution in France, for example. So these are the two kinds of, um, of rights aggregation that we are doing, domestic uh, on the one hand and international. Is that clear to anyone? Do you have questions or I cannot see you? No. Yeah, I, I think I mentioned it, but uh, in the case of uh, the, the aggregation model, so no MG, no minimum guarantee, the rights holder do support their technical expenses most of the time, and a commission from 20 to 30% is applied on the platform's payment. So this is the model you have with the uh, aggregators. So, uh, about the marketplaces, uh, so the, the, the marketplace is both global and local. When I talk about the new global marketplace, I, I talk about the global VOD platforms. So these platforms you can see are listed uh, on the screen. It goes from iTunes, Netflix, Vimeo, but you have also Sony. Uh, people uh, that are using uh, PlayStation, for example, have access to a VOD store on their PlayStation. Same with Microsoft on their Xbox. So uh, these are what we call the global market, uh, the global VOD platforms. They are available everywhere in the world, except uh, maybe for North Korea and Ukraine. But otherwise, uh, you can access an iTunes store everywhere. And the iTunes store will be what we call localized. It's not the same iTunes store when you go in France, you have specific films, uh, than when you go in Amsterdam. So these platforms, in terms of market shares, have significant market shares because they have a, a big a power strike thanks to uh, uh, their, their um, economical uh, weight. Uh, as I said, they have a centralized digital supply chain uh, that allow them to ingest a large amount of uh, volume of content. Uh, for, uh, there is a study uh, from the European uh, Observatory uh, of Audiovisual that showed uh, two or three years ago that iTunes was actually uh, the VOD platform in Europe having the biggest uh, European uh, catalog. So, because their, their, um, their target is to be the most ex exhaustive possible. Um, also, they, because of their size, they can generate economies of scales. And another point is that VOD is not their main interest because most of the time they have multiple activities like iTunes or Amazon are not totally focused on, on VOD. Um, these platforms do represent a real opportunity for cross-border distribution.
because uh, they, they do represent a low physical and financial barrier for international distribution. As I said, the costs are limited to the encoding ones. Uh, and once you have paid this cost, then you can, depending on the subtitles you want to produce or you already have, you can be distributed in more than 100 uh, uh, countries. They do geo-blocking, which is very convenient, especially if you want to exclude some territories from your digital distribution. And they do what they, we call multilingual packages. Uh, a package is uh, like a package is uh, um, something where you put your uh, video file and all the audio file, and it's very easy to add subtitles or dubbing depending on the sales uh, you want to make or not. If you want to expand your distribution to Italy, say, and you have an Italian dubbing, then you just need to put the Italian dubbing in the package and then you're able to be distributed there. So it's, it's quite convenient and represents a lot of opportunities. Also, the last positive point for uh, these uh, platforms is that it represents a real room for niche content. The long tail uh, is actually existing, although it's small, but it exists. And it's possible on this kind of platform where you know you can find everything. We have examples of, uh, for example, uh, uh, Belgium documentaries that we've distributed a few years ago about two uh, brothers uh, cycling. And we discovered uh, that a few months later we were selling 500 uh, units uh, of the, these documentaries in Australia uh, because there is there a small community interested in, in cycling. Uh, so uh, these uh, platforms, because of uh, their huge offer, um, offer a, um, a real room for, for the long tail. And they offer a, a choice and they allow niche uh, targeting. But of course, uh, the uh, VOD landscape is also uh, local. And uh, the major actors uh, in each country are, of course, uh, the local VOD platforms. Uh, they are generally or historically uh, the market leaders in their respective uh, territories. Um, so we can name a few like Time Warner, Comcast, uh, in the US, you have in France, uh, MyTF1 VOD or SFR, Orange. In Swiss, you have Swisscom, Sky in the UK, Maxdome in Germany, or Filmin in Spain. Um, they have uh, all their each uh, digital supply chain. So there is no one single entry point, as I dis uh, described for the global platforms. Um, and they have each ones are have specific uh, requirements, and they have their own tech specs. Uh, they are highly selective on content because they are mainstream uh, VOD stores. So they need uh, they have a few space dedicated to films, and they want to stream the most popular ones because they they have these huge market shares, and they want to address the largest audiences possible. For example, uh, Orange in France, which is the major actor, uh, the major uh, local VOD platform, do not accept uh, films that were not released theatrically, for example. It, this is their criteria. So that excludes uh, a lot of films. Um, but uh, they do represent, of course, uh, a big opportunity for domestic d distribution. Uh, it's because they have these higher market shares, then they represent a higher revenue po potential, of course, which can justify, in that case, the creation of specific material like dubbing, for example. As I said, um, they, they do represent less room for niche content but uh, they do represent opportunities for mass marketing. A marketing campaign can be very relevant with, uh, in partnership with such platforms because they have a big power strike. So uh, that can be uh, really relevant and have a real impact on the revenues.
if we look at the, um, the main markets, uh, it, it will be quick <laughs> because uh, they are not very appealing uh, slides. But uh, this is just to give you an idea of uh, what uh, the market looks like. Um, we can see that the digital revenues are catching up on physical and uh, theatrical revenues. The yellow and red parts are shrinking, whereas the, uh, the purple and the blue one are increasing. And in the end, by according to this consulting firm, by 2021, then the, uh, the adding of the two might be equal. When we look in, de in more details at um, digital revenues, uh, we can see on this uh, graph that uh, SVOD and AVOD are the main factors for growth. Uh, the TVOD uh, revenues forecast remain sensibly at the same level with uh, an increase in electronic sales through because we think people will still uh, continue to buy uh, films. For the European markets, it's, it's the same trends uh, than in the US. SVOD is uh, the main reason for the growth of the digital revenues, especially uh, because of uh, actors like uh, Netflix. Uh, and TVOD revenues are stable, but you can see on, on this graph, so the physical revenues are really, really, really shrinking and even disappearing in in darker blue and in yellow, you can see EST and rental VOD that remain stable in terms of the proportion, and SVOD is really, really uh, increase, increasing. Is it clear uh, for everyone? No questions or? Uh, yeah. So I, I'll rephrase the, the sentence. What, what's uh, ideal? Should we, uh, when discussing with an international sales agent for distribution, should we, as a so you're talking as a producer, should we keep uh, the digital uh, rights or uh, and and goes direct and go directly with an aggregator or leave the digital rights with the international sales agent? Well, I would say it, it depends, but. You need to have a very specific idea of what you want to do with the digital distribution. Some sales agents are very aware of digital distribution and can deal with aggregators and have a very pragmatic approach uh, with it. Uh, but of course, at uh, the first uh, step for, for them will be to prioritize uh, the all rights deals. What we have noticed at Under the Milky Way is that after two to three markets for a film, then nothing will happen anymore. And it's a pity that the, in that case, the rights remain with the international sales agent if nothing is done with, with them. So in that case, then you can maybe negotiate um, a, a flexible uh, uh, contract in which the digital rights can revert to you after a certain time. Because of course, the international sales agent is an expert and able to find the right distributor in each country. But of course, there are a huge number of films and sometimes the sales do not happen. And it's that in that case, it's a pity that uh, nothing happens anymore and that the rights are stuck. So, and in that case, you have a leverage uh, and you can handle the digital uh, rights directly. And then if you got the digital rights, then it depends if you want to, to, you can try to go to local platforms directly 
or as I said, if you want to access global platforms in specific territories, going through an aggregator is, is easier for you. Um, so actually, I have now um, case studies of uh, digital distribution. Uh, some very concrete examples of films that uh, we've released uh, at Under the Milky Way. Um, and before, before showing you um, these uh, uh, cases, uh, and especially the, the marketing strategy that we have had uh, for, for each of these films, I wanted to, to make a, a point on uh, the need to consider from now on uh, digital distribution as uh, something very important uh, for, for your films. The, f the first um, phenomena, phenomenon that uh, we can um, assess is that there is a, a limited circulation for a certain type of film in Europe. Uh, there is a stat saying that we have uh, about 1,800 films that are produced each year in Europe. And out of these 1,800 films, only 30% will uh, be shown outside of their country of origin. So it means that there, there is a real lack of circulation, and this is uh, really a, a pity and something that digital can probably help. Added to that, there is also uh, a second phenomena, which is the, uh, the saturation of uh, cinema screens. Uh, indeed, I don't know for the Netherlands, but uh, in France, we uh, distribute 600 films per year, which represents 12 to 13 films per week, which is huge. And when you have produced your film, worked on it for like a couple of years, and you only uh, have this uh, very uh, small window of visibility, uh, during which you have to fight against uh, 10 uh, competitors, uh, hopefully not having a Harry Potter or Spider-Man uh, within your competitors, then it's, it's very um, tough uh, to at least be uh, held in, in the theaters for more than one week. And then you disappear. And then maybe after that you will appear a few months later on a VOD platform, but then you will have to reinvest in marketing. So. Once again, there is something that needs to be done at that stage to make the circulation and the life of a film uh, more flexible and, uh, and less meaningless. And the, and, and the third phenomenon, of course, is uh, the evolution and the changing habits in audiovisual consumption in the digital era. I mean, uh, the younger audiences are less and less going to the theaters and they're watching films on any devices. They can watch film on their phone. A producer was telling me yesterday that uh, she noticed that some of them in the subway were watching film without sound. So it's, it's a, there is really a, a new way of watching films to which we need to adapt and consider maybe uh, from the very uh, creation of each content but at least we, we have to have this in mind when we think distribution, because we need to address to an audience that exists and not to uh, empty seats in, in the theater. So all these three uh, phenomena uh, says that we need an alternative distribu digital distribution and that there is a need uh, to experiment a lot of things in digital, like uh, straight to VOD releases, meaning that uh, you release your film directly on v VOD platforms, or uh, what we call in France e-cinema, which is the simultaneous uh, release uh, of a film on all the local VOD uh, platform. Day and date releases, uh, which used to be uh, highly debated and is not anymore, which consists in the simultaneous release uh, of a film in theater and on VOD platforms, or festival to date releases, where uh, you release a film uh, during a festival. At that time, the film has a certain level of visibility. You get press uh, about the film, and then you make your film available on a VOD platform, and then people 
we, uh, who uh, do not live in the city where the festival is held will get a chance to uh, watch it on video, for example. These are the kind of experiments that you can do with uh, digital and that you, we need to experiment right now because otherwise uh, we will not be able to address the good audience uh, uh, in the proper way. So I'll start with the first documentary that uh, we have released uh, digitally. The film is in question is called uh, CERN. It's an Austrian movie and it's a documentary that is uh, taking us to the heart of a large hadron collider. Uh, so uh, this is a scientific documentary about uh, the particles accelerator that uh, exists in Switzerland and about uh, the European uh, Center for Nuclear Research. So as you can see, it's a quite niche documentary and, um, and targeting, uh, trying to explain the work uh, of this uh, research center. Uh, but very, um, how to say, very niche. Uh, why uh, such a film did arrive uh, to us? So it's a film that uh, was sold by uh, the sales agent uh, Outlook Film, uh, which is an Austrian uh, sales uh, agent. And uh, we included the documentary in our edition of Walk This Way, which is a European uh, funded program that distributes a film uh, straight to VOD all over Europe and all over the world. The idea of uh, the Walk This Way program that we are coordinating is that we need to improve the circulation of films in Europe and that VOD can be uh, really helpful uh, for that. So we, dis we decided that we would uh, release uh, the film uh, direct to VOD with uh, an important uh, digital marketing strategy. Uh, the release uh, strategy was both in Europe and in the US. In Europe, uh, we were releasing uh, the film in Spain, Germany, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Finland, and the UK. And on the other side of the Atlantic, we were releasing the film in the US and in Canada. Uh, so the film was part of a, a, a bigger uh, collection called Documentaries from uh, Around the World, but uh, we identified that this film could be uh, marketed uh, on its own and decided to, to focus on it, especially in the US, where we identified that uh, we could uh, do uh, some uh, good revenues. So uh, when we decided to focus on the US, so we released it during summer 2016, uh, the first thing is that we created uh, new elements for the marketing. Uh, most of the time, especially if you deal with uh, social networks, you have to have a uh, proper uh, material. So a new trailer was um, created, a shorter one, more dynamic, especially for these kind of films, uh, we needed to have a very appealing uh, material. And then, uh, for our digital strategy, we uh, decided to uh, focus on two targets uh, very specifically. The first one was a, a, a broad target interested in general documentary. It, the, because uh, you can, I, I need to take a step back, this kind of audience you can uh, easily identify on Facebook, for example, because the... Um, the number of information people are letting on Facebook is so big, we are able to target very specifically uh, the persons depending on uh, their center of interest, their age, the, the city they are living in. So we, we decided for this film that we would use uh, Facebook ads and uh, these two targets. So the first one, interest in documentary in general, uh, but a certain interest in physics as well to be able to, to, to talk to the good people. The ages were from 25 to 65 and plus, and in that case, the target size was over 7 million people. Then 
we decided to do a second campaign that was simultaneous, um, talking to people interested in, the U in this uh, CERN, European uh, Center for uh, Nuclear Research, specifically. So, of course, they would have this interest in documentaries and physics, but also CERN. Their ages was from 35 to 65 and plus. And you can see that it's uh, very precise because the target size is much more uh, lower. It's 29,000 people. So these two targets uh, were addressed. And uh, we could see how they reacted uh, when uh, we showed them the trailer of CERN on their Facebook uh, pages. So you can see that the reach for the large documentary uh, size, so this is the first uh, template, uh, first line, uh, we reached uh, more than 250,000 persons. And you can see uh, below their reaction to the post, their comment, and the shares. So these are the way people interact when they, they were confronted to the trailer. So we see that uh, over 1,000 people reacted uh, to uh, the trailer, uh, 160 comments, and 385 shares. When we look at the small CERN audience, of course, much more precise, then we reached 25,000 uh, people. But then what's interesting is uh, to see that they overreacted compared to the large documentary, because of course they were more interested in it. So uh, more reactions to uh, the post uh, um, with uh, 1,381 reactions, 79 comments, and 549 shares. So this was a really uh, successful campaign because we really got uh, the feeling that uh, we were talking to the good uh, persons. Uh, and in terms of uh, repetition, um, every targeted user uh, saw uh, the, the trailer or the post uh, more than three times. So each time uh, these people were really uh, tracked uh, to uh, to see uh, the film. So when we look at the cells, uh, we can see uh, different peaks. The very first one on the 29th of August, so at the right here, is the pre-order uh, period. So it's when uh, the film is not uh, released, but you can pre-order uh, the film. So this was uh, a, a good, uh, actually, uh, score uh, for such a specific documentaries. Then the first peak you can see on uh, September the 6th is the placement uh, that uh, we uh, got uh, on iTunes. Uh, so iTunes actually was aware of the campaign that uh, we were uh, doing in, um, in the US and gave uh, to the film a good placement in the documentary section so that we were sure uh, that uh, we were uh, uh, very well visible to the people coming. And then you can find uh, the peak uh, corresponding to uh, the um, two peaks on the 10th and on the 17th corresponding to the um, Facebook campaigns. And in terms of uh, revenue, so uh, for example, so this is an example of uh, what we did. So nine territories in total were covered uh, uh, with the distribution. We can see that 77% uh, uh, of the sales uh, was done in the US, where we identified that this community uh, was very, very active. Um, and uh, we had roughly 12% of the sales in, in Europe. Uh, in total, what we call uh, units, so this can be uh, uh, rentings or uh, um, uh, downloads, uh, were at uh, 22,000 units. And in total, we generated a 46k uh, uh, euros uh, revenue. So this was a, a very uh, positive uh, campaign that we have done uh, with an investment uh, for the US of 2K uh, euros. But the investment mentioned here is not uh, 
does not take into account what it costs also to redo uh, the trailer, for example, and of course the technical costs. But it's still, uh, it, it would not be more than 5k uh, euros in total. Quick question. Yes. Okay. What language was the, was the documentary in and did you read over for different territories or what was the, how did you tailor it for territories? Oh, it was subtitled. For each territories, it was subtitled in, in, in the lang local languages, but not dubbed. So this was another hurdle uh, to overcome. Was it in German originally? Yes, originally German. Actually, if you want to be distributed in local, uh, in global platforms, uh, you have, ex except for some territories, but for the main European territories and US and LATAM, you have to be uh, subtitled in, in the local languages, otherwise it's not ac accepted. So that, that was a, a first example of uh, a digital release of uh, a documentaries, a documentary. Uh, the second example is a, a feature film. I, uh, it's a feature film because I wanted to show you uh, the specificity of the marketing that we have made for this one. So it's not a documentary, but I thought the, the, the marketing strategy could be interesting. So... <clears throat> The film is in question is called uh, Made in France. I don't know if you heard about it. It's a French movie uh, that was shot in 2013 and there was um, a lot of buzz around it because it was supposed to, uh, to be uh, released. It was produced before the terror attacks in Paris and it was su supposed to be released the week after the terror attacks uh, took place. And the topic is uh, about terrorists and, uh, and, and a very similar situation to uh, the dramatic events uh, we had in Paris. So um, with this event, uh, the, um, the story of these films changed a lot. And a lot of theaters were, were not accepting uh, to release the film because uh, they thought it could be uh, dangerous. And so uh, a lot of territories also uh, did not want to, to release the films. So we uh, at Under the Milky Way decide, decided to acquire this time the all rights for uh, the US territories because uh, on um, a traditional uh, uh, way of uh, working, we uh, usually uh, buy... Um, French uh, films uh, on an all right basis for uh, some titles each year because we think there is a community appealed in French films uh, in the US and that uh, we can do uh, some physical uh, releases at the same time as digital for this kind of films. So we acquired uh, Made in France um, uh, with our local uh, company in, uh, in Los Angeles and decided to release it theatrically on the first, uh, on the first uh, hand, and then in a second time, uh, digitally. So the release date was uh, in September 2016, and we had just one theater, because when we uh, acquire these kind of films, we aim at uh, releasing, uh, doing very small releases, and then uh, making the film circulate a lot in theaters and festivals. But one release at a time. So the th theater we identified was the Tower Theater in Miami. And for that film, we created a new poster uh, with, as you could see, the Eiffel Tower and again, and a new trailer also that was uh, more uh, dynamic and uh, more adapted to the US uh, audience. Uh, we had um, three uh, targets. And we decided to target the people that were living 10 miles radius uh, around the theater that in which we were releasing uh, the film. And we, were, we wanted to uh, target the f people interested in independent films, foreign films, French films, uh, but in, th in, in theatrical releases. So we had three uh, targets. The first, first one was uh, the French audience living in that area. So it, means, uh, that, uh, it meant that they, they had uh, to speak French. 
Then the Tower Theatre audience, which is quite uh, older, uh, 45 to 65. And then uh, people interested also in thriller and action themes, uh, ages uh, from 20 to 45. So we crossed uh, these three uh, targets uh, and decided to use uh, Facebook ads uh, as well. So the results are here. You can see the amounts uh, in the first template, the amount uh, spent on each uh, campaign. So each campaign do correspond to a very uh, specific uh, audience. Um, so uh, for the French uh, audience, we spent $500. Uh, for uh, the audience uh, that is uh, used to go to uh, the theater, uh, the tower theater, uh, $750. And for the um, young, same amount for the young audience interested in thrillers and action uh, th themes. In, in the gr graph uh, below, you can, uh, you can see the reach, meaning the size of the audience that we uh, finally uh, targeted and reached. And uh, the cross uh, shows uh, the repetition, how many times the audience have, be, uh, have seen uh, uh, the same message uh, repeated. So you can see that, for example, the, the French community on this graph is the reach was 9K, quite low, but each person from this 9K uh, audience has, been, uh, uh, has seen the trailer at least three times. So this is a, a huge uh, repetition. And you can see the video views and the cost uh, per video view uh, at the end. So in, oops, in terms of results, we, can, we could say at that time that uh, the, um, it was a successful launch because the targeting the marketing campaign helped us to secure a good opening window weekend which is very important in the US and led us uh, to have the film held uh, for a second week, week in Miami. And then we got, uh, through this release, we were able to get press and an additional 10 new markets, then uh, that's how they called uh, the, the theaters in, in the US, were booked, uh, including Chicago, Boston, San Francisco. And then Concerning the VOD releases, uh, we uh, waited uh, to, till December to release the film on all the global platforms. And thanks to um, the local cinema release and, uh, and the press we got, we were uh, able to have the film selected by the major local VOD providers as well, like Comcast, uh, Charter, Time Warner, Cox, and so forth. And the film uh, rapidly integrated our top uh, 25 best releases in the US. So this is uh, another example of what can be done. Of course, the investment is higher because you have to, uh, to invest for a, a small theatrical release, but you can use it also as a good window, especially in the US, to uh, receive press uh, for uh, your digital uh, release afterwards. Can I ask you about the, why you chose that theater in Miami? Uh, because um, we were able to to have to rent it actually, and uh, because we identified that there is a, a big French community uh, in Miami as well. And it's easier to have access there than in New York where it's very expensive uh, to do the same with uh, theaters. And uh, we thought that uh, due to the theme of the film, it, was, it would have been difficult to do it in New York. Was the plan always to make more revenue from the VOD than the theatrical, to use the theatrical as a press platform? Yes, yes, exactly. Um, then the, um, uh, the other example I, I have is uh, another documentary on uh, called a German one, uh, again, 
called uh, 10 billion what's on your plate uh, and this is a documentary uh, from Germany looking at a, a response for uh, the challenge uh, the challenge of food security uh, that will happen I think that uh, I haven't seen the documentary, but it says that by 2050, uh, we will be 10 million on uh, the earth, and we have to think, uh, we will have a major food crisis, and we have to think from now on to find uh, responses, and answers, concrete answers to this crisis, and find new ways of feeding uh, ourselves. Um, this film was selected because they had uh, a lot of unsold uh, territories, um, the, I think the sales agent is Outlook Film Sales again, and it was selected uh, in our uh, in this year's uh, edition of uh, Walk This Way, our European-funded uh, uh, program. Uh, part of uh, the uh, documentary documentaries from around the world collection. Uh, we also uh, identified quite quickly that uh, this was a quite popular topic and that uh, we uh, would um, put some uh, investment, marketing investment on this film because uh, we thought that uh, this topic could be uh, marketed to very specific audiences. So the distribution strategy was a direct to VOD uh, release in a lot of territories supported with uh, digital marketing and digital PR uh, as well. The release took, took place uh, during last March, and so we had this simultaneous release in 27 territories. So in Latin, Latin America, the US, Canada, Japan, uh, but also Belgium, Scandinavia, Italy, and the UK in Europe. And of course, uh, the film was released in, uh, on all the global VOD platforms and on the local VOD platforms that accepted it. Um, for the marketing strategy, we decided to invest in a new trailer to make it uh, more uh, dynamic with uh, uh, big headlines that uh, would uh, strike the, the viewer. Uh, we coordinated a transversal marketing strategy as well with uh, uh, Facebook ads uh, in all the territories. And we coordinated a PR strategy in the US and in Europe. Uh, we uh, realized on a very uh, specific um, uh, PR teams that are loca loc located uh, in Spain, Scandinavia, the UK, and were able to touch uh, all the, the press uh, there. Uh, and in the US as well, we, we work with um, a, 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 a company called uh, Big Time, I think. And uh, last but not least, we did a lot of grassroots marketing uh, in the US as well. Grassroots marketing is, um, is a, a work, uh, a specific work where, where you really um, try to reach uh, communities that are linked to the topic of your documentary. In that case, uh, our um, agent in the US contacted uh, a lot of uh, associations uh, in the US so that they would uh, either uh, make a tweet about the documentary or a newsletter or uh, anything that uh, can uh, uh, be uh, a good support to the release of the film and bring the film clo closer to the audience we target. So this is uh, another uh, kind of uh, success. Um, in total, for now, we sold uh, 3.5K units, uh, which corresponds to a total revenue of 5.5K uh, euros. Uh, you can see how it spreads uh, across the world with 57% uh, of the sales done uh, in the US. And you can see uh, also on this part, the, um, uh, how the sales are spread according to the platform, uh, iTunes being um, the biggest one. But you can see also uh, Amazon and Google uh, are quite important. 
And I wanted to drive your attention to the pink uh, triangle, which corresponds to a platform called Canopy, and uh, which is an interesting outlet for um, uh, documentaries or catalog films, uh, because it's, um, it's an, uh, what we call an institutional uh, VOD platform. Uh, it reaches all the universities and the uh, Cinematheque uh, uh, across uh, the US. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's a very good platform for um, uh, films or documentaries with uh, society topics, for example. I've added uh, some figures so that you can have uh, an ID, but of course uh, it's, it's just figures and examples of uh, films that we have distributed and that I'm sharing with you. But uh, each distribution is uh, of course uh, specific. But um, for example, a huge success for us would be a film called Master of the Universe, a documentary um, about, uh, I think, a Swiss banker or, or a German banker uh, uh, and about the financial crisis. So this film was a really uh, a big success for us and a big surprise as well. Uh, we made uh, the, the major part of the revenues in the US where the film had a good uh, review, even though it was only a straight to VOD uh, release. Uh, and so we uh, generated uh, almost 100,000 uh, K euro uh, with this film. But then we have sometimes uh, also uh, a lot of surprises. Even we are, if we are distributing films every day, we discover um, a strange success, hopefully, uh, every day. And this is the case of the Greasy and Preachers. Uh, which uh, talks about uh, motorcycle me mechanics, um, so a very specific uh, topic a as well. And uh, the thing that helped us a lot uh, for this film was that uh, we got uh, Orlando Bloom, uh, the, uh, I, I, I think it's American, American actor, that is really into mechanics and into motorcycle that uh, supported the film uh, through uh, one or two tweets. And it made a real uh, difference uh, dis uh, than uh, promoting uh, the film. Then, sorry? Do you pay him to do that? No, no, no. That, that, that was fortunate. <laughs> no, what we pay is the PR uh, person, so the person in charge of uh, talking uh, to uh, the press, and we pay our Facebook ads uh, campaign uh, directly. But uh, having access to the talents is uh, very difficult, and uh, we would not be able to to pay him. Even uh, as you can see, with uh, 45k euros, I think it's uh, the equivalent of uh, I don't know. Uh, for him, it's nothing. So for us, it's a success. Um, then uh, a third example of very good performance is a Washoku, a documentary about food. Food is a very uh, uh, successful topic right now in the documentary uh, that we are releasing on uh, digital. We also have the example of Bella Vita, uh, which is a, a US documentary about surfing. So surfing, I think uh, there are a lot of uh, surfers uh, communities around the world and it's a genre that uh, travels very well as well. Um, then we have Darwin, a, f uh, a feature film about uh, a small city in, in the US. Uh, so you see between 16,000 and 45,000, it's a very good performance according to us especially when uh, you think of the initial investments uh, we've made. Um, when you see of uh, the technical uh, costs, uh, basically it's uh, 1,800 to 1,000 euros for encoding costs. And then you, you will, I will detail that later, but uh, if you have uh, to add uh, several platforms, it costs between 80 to 200 euros per platform. So say with uh, 1,500 euros, you have, you have your encoding cost, 
plus the subtitling you have to finance. And then you can see that it's a good operation uh, if you generate a revenue of 45k euros. It's, uh, I know these are very low figures com compared to th some theatrical performances, but this has to be relativized and uh, put in front of the real investment uh, we are making in front. Uh, standard performance, uh, these, uh, these are Planet Yoga, uh, which is a documentary, of course, about uh, yoga with uh, 7,000 euros, or The Apostle, which is a French uh, film, uh, generating uh, 11,000 uh, euros. Uh, of course, religion is also a quite successful uh, topic sometimes. And then you can see... The, the medium performances uh, with uh, Looking for Amish, a, a comedy, 2,500 uh, euros. You can see that with this kind of level, it's, uh, it's pretty sure that you are almost recouping, but uh, it's just uh, the, um, the technical costs. And you see that below, uh, the films are either break-even or doesn't break-even. Break so this gives you the huge variety of, uh, of results uh, you can get uh, through digital distribution. Do you also work with short films? Uh, no, because uh, on these platforms, it's, it's not the good media for them. We, we did try uh, some on iTunes, and it did not work. So I think there are uh, alternative platforms for short films, but that uh, people coming in these platforms uh, will not be looking for it. And iTunes is not giving a lot of visibility to the short films. Yes? The cost of the, um, the marketing uh, things, like yeah. the marketing activities, the first thing, was it borne by US distributor or was it is it part of the agreement that it will be deducted in the uh, no. uh, revenue? Well, I, I rephrased the. I was asked to rephrase the question. <laughs> um, so, um, regarding the marketing cost, is it us bearing it or uh, the right holder? Uh, the thing is that uh, we never recoup marketing costs because actually the marketing spendings are. As I, I showed you, uh, you can invest 100 euros to 5,000 euros and have a res um, zero in terms of sales. So <coughs> it, it's so difficult to link it to the sales that uh, either we bear it 100% when the film is part of a European funded program, uh, and in that case, uh, the marketing costs are subsidized uh, but otherwise, uh, uh, we do um, advise uh, the producer to do its own social network marketing on its own. But it's nothing; it's never recouped from from the sales. The only marketing part that the aggregator is doing is what we call the trade marketing part. All this work uh, to get a better placement and a better pl visibility on the store including uh, putting the film uh, into promotions because uh, the iTunes uh, or the Google uh, teams are doing promotions on some films. They are asking everyone uh, that is ref uh, on the store if they want to take part of it and then we can provide them with a list of film and then with this kind of trade marketing we can help the visibility of, uh, of the film. But otherwise, it's... Digital marketing is a very uncharted territory. No one has, like the, um, find, uh, has found the secret receipt where you can say, I invest uh, 1,000, I'm able to uh, sell uh, 2,000 uh, units. It's, uh, it's uh, much more difficult than it used to be for DVDs when I used to work a, a long time ago at uh, Studio Canal, which is a, a French uh, studio. Uh, of the Canal Plus group, and um, at that time we were able to know how many DVDs uh, we would sell uh, depending on the theatrical performance of the film and depending on the marketing investments. That was quite mechanic, and uh, we could use a TV ad. We knew that it would bring uh, uh, that many sales, so that was um, 
uh, much more clear uh, at that time, whereas with digital marketing, and that's what uh, we need a lot of uh, experimentations, uh, everything needs to be tested. And, um, and this is why uh, at Under the Milky Way, we are part of a lot of uh, uh, EU-funded programs because uh, we think that it's key, uh, the promotion is key. Uh, making your film available on the platform is a very good thing, but if no one knows that it's there, then it's, uh, it's complex. And uh, we need a lot of funds to invest and, uh, and this cannot be borne either by the rights holder or by us because we, we cannot afford it. So uh, it's a real uh, field, a search field that needs to be uh, experimented and subsidized by uh, the media program, for example, which they are doing. So, uh, so here we are uh, with some figures. Do you have other questions for this example? Yes. Do you find platforms like uh, Instagram and Snapchat give you better cut through with younger audiences if you're trying to target a younger audience? Uh, we tried uh, to do that. Uh, actually, we did that in Scandinavia uh, this this year. And uh, when we look at the cost per action and the results, uh, it's a good result. So it's it's performing better towards this audience. But it does not. It did not in that case transform into sales. So we reached the audience, but then. The thing is that with iTunes, as it is a closed uh, environment, we are uh, not able to, tr to I, uh, clearly track uh, the, the persons once she has clicked on the ad. We do not know, we know she has gone on the iTunes store, but we do not know if she buys. But when we looked uh, for that film uh, on the sales results, uh, nothing happened, even though the results on the campaign on Instagram were good. Um, the thing is that when you do a true view campaign on YouTube, uh, you are able really to track uh, on the other side uh, the people because it's the same Google environment. So if you put your trailer in front of another trailer targeting uh, an audience that uh, likes action movie, for example, and that is that age and uh, very precise, then you are able to know whether uh, once she, uh, he or she has clicked, if they have gone on the uh, Google Play Store, because this is the same uh, environment. And is there a, is there a, a Facebook SVOD platform no. yet? No, they, they, they tried to do VOD, TVOD at, at one point, but uh, for now, no, there, there is no service like that. Okay, um, so the final part, um, for uh, I'm, I'm totally blind now, so if you have questions, please raise your voice because I cannot see uh, anything. <laughs> um, uh, yes, the, the last part of the presentation was uh, to give you some tips to get the most out of your digital, digital distribution. I assume that uh, as a producer or a filmmaker, you might uh, sometimes want to keep the digital uh, rights for yourself and, uh, and handle uh, your digital distribution because uh, you are aware of your audience or what exactly you want to, to do with your film. So the first thing is that you need to integrate digital distribution in your strategy from day one, as you can see, it's accessible and you have to define the best way to get there at any point in time and adapt your strategy along the way. Digital is also flexible, so it's a, it's a good thing to have it always uh, in mind. Then keep your options uh, open. This is the question you, you raised uh, earlier about uh, should I uh, keep the rights or should I leave it with a uh, sales agent. The idea is don't let go of rights for which you do not have a precise idea of how they will be exploited. Because there's nothing more frustrating than uh, having worked so long on a film and and seeing it disappear and not having even reports of uh, where it is uh, sold and what's happening with, with the films. So uh, with digital, then you can track easily and in a more transparent way also uh, uh, the sales uh, around your film. 
be extra careful with material. This is an advice that uh, we keep on saying to uh, all the producers and the filmmakers. Every stills, posters, all the material you have uh, around your films, you have uh, to be extra careful because uh, digital platforms have very high standards uh, regarding the, the material uh, they get. Uh, so you need to produce and maintain a perfect uh, source material because if your poster is not a real poster or if you do not have stills uh, or uh, the good uh, graphic file for your poster or the group uh, the good uh, technical standard for your audio uh, video file then uh, it's highly probable that uh, these big uh, global platforms will not accept uh, your film because uh, they have uh, very uh, specific uh, standards and guidelines. Be willing to experiment. As I said, uh, it's, a, it's a battlefield right now uh, for digital and you do not need to be shy from, from new ways of getting films distributed, especially when you look at the traffic jam that is in theaters with this huge number of films released each week. Uh, you can be curious and experimental uh, when uh, uh, looking at new ways of being distributed. Uh, day and dates or festival to dates, for example, can be a good ways of uh, increasing the visibility around uh, your films and using the digital as a good way to, to target uh, uh, audiences. And then, of course, I hope uh, you were not too disappointing, but uh, you need to manage your expectations. As I said, uh, digital distribution is still for uh, the most part an uncharted territory. So uh, when I showed you the, um, the figures, you, you, you must think that you should prepare for the worst and hope for the best, uh, because it's a, it's a huge, uh, market and a real battle to to get visibility and there is of course uh, as I said uh, a lot of uncertainty uh, in in these releases but at least you make your film uh, circulate and be available and I know talking to a lot of producers that, that there's nothing more frustrating as well when people ask to see your uh, your film and it's not available anywhere, uh, and you have to find a, a, an old uh, Blu-ray or an old DVD to, to be able to show your film. At least with digital distribution, you have the possibility to make it uh, available uh, everywhere uh, around the world. Some... Um, basics for the budget, as I told you, so that you, that you can have in mind uh, all the, um, what uh, implies uh, digital distribution in terms of investment. So subtitling and, and dubbing, of course, subtitling is 500 to uh, 1,000 euro per language, roughly. But uh, of course, except for rare uh, languages like Japanese or Korean, uh, for example. Uh, the thing is that uh, going through an aggregator is also a, a way of uh, getting advice. Uh, we uh, sometimes uh, get uh, um, uh, films for which the rights holder wants uh, to, sorry, wants to uh, release the film in uh, all the languages uh, possible, and uh, which is quite expensive, of, of course. In the end, when you add languages after languages, and with uh, our uh, 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 daily work, we are now able to uh, tell you uh, whether it's worth it or not to invest in that language for that territory. This is uh, something that, uh, uh, thanks to the volume of films we're working uh, with, uh, we are now able to see and advise uh, uh, the rights holders. Also, what we often do is that we, we start uh, releasing the film in some territories and once we, we have a success or good results, then we decide to invest in other territories. This is also a way of uh, working and not taking too much risk uh, at one time. Of course, uh, dubbing is uh, quite much more expensive uh, and should be reserved for high potential titles, of course, or animated titles. 
Uh, then uh, you have uh, the encoding uh, expenses, encoding costs. So the base uh, for an iTunes package is 500 to 800 uh, euros. And as I said, if you want to add uh, extra platforms, you have to count between 80 uh, euros to 200 euros per platform. Um, so usually what uh, we advise at Under the Milky Way is uh, from the very beginning to invest in all the platforms, uh, except uh, for uh, niche documentaries where it would not make sense to be present on the Sony store, for example, or the micro, micro box, uh, Microsoft Xbox uh, stores. But otherwise, it's uh, easier uh, and it makes more sense uh, when you decide to release your film to be on all the platforms so that people can really find you, uh, your film easily. And as I said, uh, uh, thanks to your question, uh, for marketing, it's very hard to define a necessary uh, budget uh, for the moment for marketing uh, because of the uncertainty uh, of the results. Uh, there is probably a critical level of investment uh, that needs to, to be very high, but uh, for now it's, um, it's, it, it's very difficult to see a conversion uh, for marketing into sales, which leads me to the three main uh, objectives you have to remember uh, while doing uh, digital marketing. The, f the first uh, that you need to, to have in mind is to raise awareness, uh, to reach a critical mass of people and to target a, a, a large uh, audience. So uh, as uh, I showed you, uh, the idea is to create repetition, to stick in the head of uh, the audience uh, you're targeting and to track the behavior of uh, the people that have clicked on your trailer, for example, uh, and that uh, showed to be uh, the mo most interested in your, sorry, in your film. Then once you have raised uh, awareness, address the targets, identify the relevant audiences and make them uh, aware of the film. So thanks to digital, we have a lot of information, as I showed you about the audiences, where they live, how old they are, uh, what kind of films they do like. And you have tools like the Facebook pixels that uh, allow you to track the people uh, on your website and identify the audience uh, that is uh, interested in your topic and generate, uh, enlarge this audience by uh, looking for lookalike uh, people. So uh, with the pixel, you are able to, to target really uh, bigger and bigger audiences. And then increase, of course, increase uh, conversion, even though uh, this is a, a difficult uh, thing to, uh, to prove, but uh, of course, uh, share the links to the platforms where your film are available is uh, obvious to, to make while you, you're doing your digital marketing uh, campaign. Uh, and you can also target the days and the hours of conception and pay for specific campaigns at that time on uh, um, uh, platforms like Facebook or Google, for example. They can make a very precise uh, st a strategy for that. So uh, as I said, these are the kind of tools that we used, uh, th that we use in our um, uh, EU programs when we get uh, funds uh, to experiment a digital uh, marketing campaign. So of course digital advertising uh, with uh, ads based on specific marketing assets. We create uh, shorter clips, graphic cards, uh, GIFs, anything built to increase the conversion and that is easy and short uh, for the audience to grasp. Uh, so we work with Facebook ads uh, and they're very precise uh, targeting and also uh, YouTube TrueView, sorry. Uh, as I said, YouTube TrueView is in the same environment as Google Play, the VOD store, so you're able to, to track if there is a concrete conversion uh, between someone clicking on your trailer and actually buying uh, the film in the end. Of course, uh, we work also with uh, digital press relations uh, to increase the recommendation uh, from uh, influencing uh, media outlets. Uh, 
uh, we do some partnerships with uh, big media and uh, blogs to create uh, the awareness uh, for the film. In that case, of course, you need the, for uh, um, a professional, and it's very localized, so it's not something you can do on a transversal uh, a way. It's uh, it's it's very uh, uh, it, it it works on a country per country uh, basis. And then, uh, as I said, uh, grassroots marketing, uh, which addresses uh, specific communities and organizations uh, that cater the specific targets uh, so that you can have a direct access to them. Um, you need, uh, in that case, uh, to contact a lot of organizations. It's a very uh, time-consuming work. Uh, and in that case, also, it's, uh, it's something you can do alone, but it's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, of uh, work, and it implies to have a huge uh, database of uh, contacts. Uh, then we have like four factors of success uh, to take into account in your, sorry, uh, any questions regarding di digital marketing or? Yeah, yeah it's, it's based on a pretty uh, specific audience, but how do you say open minded for an audience? Uh, sorry, I didn't grab the question. How, how do you stay open minded? Oh, okay. Well, uh, then it's uh, it, it's uh, first it's too bad, uh, but then uh, through digital you can identify uh, cells in certain territories and then readdress your targets. And also, it, it with digital it's uh, very flexible. You can learn, and this is something that we usually do uh, with our Facebook campaigns. We readdress when when we. Uh, when we notice that a campaign towards a specific audience does not work, then we readdress and change it, which uh, was not the case uh, with the old ways of doing marketing, but it's a learning process. So in the end, hopefully, we finally address the good audience. But we have the flexibility not to spend all of our money on the wrong one. Okay. So um, a few slides uh, now uh, for the factors of success uh, for, uh, to take into account uh, for the uh, digital uh, distribution. First is timing. Timing is crucial, especially when you work with big uh, global VOD platform. Uh, so announcing the release in advance and respecting deadlines is something that will help you to have a, a good placement and be considered by uh, the platform. Uh, the way we work at Under the Milky Way is that we start sourcing for the film six months ahead. Uh, during which we uh, identify the film, deal with the contract, decide on the territories where we want the film to be released. Then the um, material uh, has to be delivered to the encoding house three months ahead. The title is presented to the platforms two months before the release. And then you can open a pre-order um, strategy uh, one month and a half before the release and uh, what we called an early OST, uh, which is a period uh, of one week during which uh, the audience that is aware of uh, the distribution of your film can buy it only, not rent it, but the film is available for purchase. This is a possibility. But as you see, we work uh, six months ahead of the VOD release to make sure that uh, uh, everyone can uh, gather all the necessary material. Uh, our local agents, for example, in the case of an international distribution, uh, will be able to pitch all the, lo the local platforms uh, in a proper way. Another factor of success is the page uh, of your film, the promotional material that you get and the, the, the way your film page uh, will be set. Uh, having a good artwork is crucial. Of course, when people are navigating on iTunes store, not knowing exactly which film they want to, uh, to buy, they will make a de their decision based on a few things. Uh, of which the, the poster and the trailer, and also maybe uh, the comments uh, you get uh, from other people that have uh, 
a boat or viewed uh, the film. But uh, this is uh, something that will definitely uh, help you um, securing the placement for your film and, uh, and your sales. So uh, like having these uh, big photos uh, is something that uh, is, uh, is uh, quite important. And then the placement, of course, uh, this is, uh, well, this is part of the, the work of uh, an aggregator, but uh, ensuring that your film will be, uh, will receive the adapted uh, placement uh, is essential to maximize the sales. We have examples of uh, films uh, that had a huge visibility but uh, did not perform into sales because they were not having the right placement. Having the right placement is be being exactly on the store where people interested in your topic will look for you. Not uh, If you uh, release an unknown uh, uh, film uh, with uh, no cast uh, or, I don't know, a very old actor, it's no need for you to be on the front page like the Don't Breathe uh, poster because people uh, uh, will not look for your film here. They will look uh, into other sections and you need to be uh, well uh, uh, placed in, in these sections, preferably on the left side of the screen where people uh, mechanically uh, start uh, looking uh, for a film. It's also something that uh, the editorial teams uh, have a role for. The editorial teams for, of the platforms uh, can also uh, decide where exactly to put the film and depending on the cells will keep the film at the, the good placement. And the last thing I mentioned was the price promotions uh, because participating in adapted uh, price promotions is uh, a, a true sales driver in the long run, uh, being part of these uh, 99 cents uh, rental operations is something that is always good for the life cycle of a film that will uh, be uh, and gain, that will gain uh, through these uh, promotions a new visibility and it's a new opportunity to, to be uh, also uh, well placed on, on the platform. So uh, here are, here are some tips I could give you regarding digital distribution. I think we still have uh, like eight to ten minutes. Yeah, so if you have specific questions or things you, for which you need more explanations, I'm, I'm all here. Yes, yes, we do. We actually we have uh, films coming from filmmakers, producers, uh, local distributors, and sales agents. Everything is uh, possible. Um, we uh, we do contracts with uh, very big companies, and sometimes contract with one person for one film. So, uh, being a digital company helps you leverage all these kind of uh, situations. And uh, for producers uh, or filmmakers, it, this is the case where for um, territories uh, that were unsold or, for example, most of the time, the producers or the filmmakers are keeping the film for their domestic territories where they are really aware of uh, who can be interested in distributing the film and, uh, and gives us the digital rights for the rest of uh, the world.